Pulp Crazy. House of the Dragon Season 1 Episode 10 has come and gone, as has the entirety of Season 1 of House of the Dragon. But that's okay. We got Season 2 on the way. That's been confirmed. And I think the end of this episode and the end of this season leaves us in a really intriguing place. But before getting into the end of the season, let's just talk about the episode as a whole here first. I thought that this was another really strong episode by everybody involved. I gotta tell you, I really felt for Renera there when she lost her baby. That was pretty sad. Great performance there by Emma Darcy. And how about Matt Smith and the way he's playing Damon Targaryen? I swear, one second you love this guy, and then there's scenes like where he's choking Rhaenyra. That kind of brings me to this topic. It seems like the writing staff, Condole, they're really trying to make both sides seem both sympathetic and a little bit antagonistic. There really isn't one true good side. In previous episodes, they made the Greens a little bit more sympathetic than in the source material when Alicent believes that Viserys is saying that he wishes Aegon to succeed him on his deathbed. That wasn't in the source material. So that was put in there to kind of soften the Greens a little bit. And in this episode, they did that again with Prince Aemond really not meaning to kill Prince Luke and Aemon just wanting the proverbial eye for an eye from his nephew. Now keep in mind, everything that happened at Storm's End and with Luke riding off and Aemon chasing him like a madman, that was all in the source material, right up to Aemon having a sapphire in his empty eye socket. Now I just want to touch on the Baratheons real quick. They're kind of a red-headed stepchild or brown-haired stepchild of House Targaryen. They really don't go into this too much in any of the TV series, Game of Thrones or House of the Dragon, but House Baratheon is very tightly tied to House Targaryen. And it all goes back to the days of Aegon the Conqueror. One of Aegon's generals was Oris Baratheon. Some people believe Oris Baratheon was Aegon the Conqueror's bastard half-brother. During Aegon's conquest, Oris defeated Argilac Durandon of House Durandon. Argilac was the old king of the Stormlands. After Oris slew Argilac, he wed Argilac's daughter, Argella Duradon. Oris kept all the heraldry and all the customs of the Storm Kings, and he became the new Storm Lord loyal to Aegon the Conqueror, and House Baratheon was born. As the years would progress, male members of House Baratheon would marry princesses or female members of House Targaryen, further strengthening the unity between the two houses. This is why Robert Baratheon in A Song of Ice and Fire or the Game of Thrones television series was said to have a stronger claim on the Iron Throne than say Ned Stark, Jon Arwen, the Lannisters, because he actually had a decent amount of Targaryen blood in him due to being descended from a parent of Aegon the Conqueror, as well as the intermingling of House Baratheon with House Targaryen over the years. Robert and his brothers Stannis and Renly were actually the grandsons of Rayleigh Targaryen, who married Ormond Baratheon. Rayleigh Targaryen was a princess. She was the daughter of Aegon the Unlikely, also known as Egg. He's one of the main characters in George R.R. R. Martin's Duncan Egg stories. Egg is the brother of Master Aemon up on the wall 
during Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire. Being the grandson of Princess Rayleigh, I think really helped Robert's claim on the Iron Throne once they deposed the Mad King, Eris, who is Daenerys' father from A Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire. It's really interesting how Martin has woven the genealogy throughout these different eras. But let's get back to Aemon versus Luke. But when Luke's dragon breathed fire and attacked Vagar first, that kind of opened the door for Vagar to attack Luke's dragon, Arax. And from the source material, we just know that there must have been a fight between the two of them, but we're not privy to any of the details. Other than that, one could infer that there was a fight that took place, and Aemond and Vagar won, and I believe Arax's body, at least maybe his head and neck, surface some time later, but Prince Luke's body is never found. However, I could see the TV series changing this and actually showing Vagar crap out Luke's body at some point. Speaking of the dragons, overall, this episode was a tour de force in special effects. I think the team did a great job, but I noticed something again. I mentioned this a few episodes ago when young Prince Aemond was trying to tame Vagar, and how that young actor, when he was in front of the dragon, it kind of took me out of the moment because the special effects kind of didn't blend together seamlessly like they normally do when a real life actor is standing in front of a computer generated dragon. In this episode, it happened again, and I actually put the image as the title card for the episode so you could look at it now. It's the shot of Prince Damon standing in front of Caraxus, the blood worm. And it's obviously the actor standing in front of a green screen. So that's twice now that this has happened, at least in my eyes, during this series. So I think next season they should probably polish that up a little bit. So the contrast between what's on the green screen and the actor standing in front of it is a little bit more seamless. Overall, I thought this was a really strong episode. Even though I knew what was going to happen, I still enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to seeing how next season begins. Kind of looking forward to getting back to dueling point of views between the blacks and the greens instead of just focusing on one faction per episode like the last two have been. And like I said, keep your eyes out because there's going to be two pulp character cameo appearances. Now this is not going to actually be these pulp characters, but they are going to definitely be analogs. And not righteous analogs either. These are some pretty bad dudes. If for some reason they're not included and even if they don't appear, don't worry. I will do a video and clue you in as to who they were meant to be and when they were meant to show up. Pulp Crazy is located at pulpcrazy.com. I'm facebook.com slash pulpcrazy. And I'm at pulpcrazy on Twitter and Instagram.